Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. We welcome you, online audiences, and those of you who watch later. This is over uh, 600 programs we've done since the pandemic started. Uh, we're almost getting ready to have live audiences back, and we've tested that a couple of times, but we're still bringing you our programs directly from our 110 the Embarcadero Center in San Francisco, uh, where we discuss with people um, the ideas, um, the politicians that come, uh, but also a lot of authors and their ideas that those uh, authors have. Today, today we're going to be talking to uh, Margaret Jacobs, a professor of uh, history, and uh, she has written a book, After 100 Years, The Search for Reconciliation Over America's Stolen Lands. Uh, we're going to be talking to her, and she'll be online in just a second, um, but we're going to be talking to her about the issues that are raised by American history out west, um, the Native Americans' uh, issues in history uh, is across the entire country, of course. Um, but she has focused on the sort of post-Civil War era in the West, uh, and those are some of the details we're going to talk about. But this is really quite applicable to a very large picture. Um, people wonder sometimes about any piece of history and say, well, it's been 100 years or it's been more than 100 years since this happened. Why are we still talking about it? Well, uh, you know, most, most uh, fights that go on are still, we're still talking about things that happen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. People are still, of course, mad about how their group was treated uh, and almost always for good reason. Uh, but today, and uh, we will be discussing this with Margaret for uh, soon, uh, today we're going to bring in, uh, in addition to what we are going to talk about the American Indians, uh, she makes a reference in her book to the Uyghurs in uh, China, in Xinjiang, uh, where the Chinese government is treating them, another group that at least was nomadic at one point, um, quite differently uh, I mean, quite differently than their usual population, but also very similarly in many different ways in terms of uh, bringing them into educational organizations, you know, to, uh, making them go, the children go to special schools and try to eliminate their culture, putting other people into concentration camp or, or, or at least re-education camps, etc. Something that's very similar to what we did to the American Indians. So, Margaret, thanks for jumping back in here. We lost you for a second. Um, I just did the lead in that I told you about ahead of time. So we're all set to roll. So. Uh, why don't you compare uh, the American situation uh, 100 years ago to the current situation in China, just to get started, then we'll go to the details of the history. Thank you, George. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here with you and, and an honor. Um, so I do make the point in the book uh, as I'm going along that some of these practices that I account for in the past in, in the United States are still being used. Uh, they're, they're policies and practices that governments are still using against indigenous or, or minority populations. And in China today, um, for example, um, I came across an article that just was so interesting to me. It was about how uh, the Chinese government is destroying burial grounds uh, of Uyghur peoples um, and uh, some of the quotes that I found in this article from Uyghur people uh, reminded me so much of what happened to American Indians when, for example, here in Nebraska, where I live, uh, the Pawnee people were removed in the 1870s. And soon after they left, people started digging up their graves and putting their skeletons and funereal objects into the Nebraska State Historical Society and other museums. Um, and we see the same thing going on with the Uyghurs today, like uh, destroying cemeteries, destroying uh, a sense of these people were here, they had a presence. Um, so that was one of the uh, comparable things I found, but also, as you mentioned, uh, 
boarding schools for American Indian children and the separation of Indian children from their families is happening today uh, among the Uyghurs as well. The Chinese government's using a similar policy. Hmm. So it is really upsetting to see that these uh, very damaging and very these gross human rights abuses that were happening against American Indians, uh, you know, 100 years ago or even, you know, 50 years ago mm-hmm. are now going on in China. Another big point you make in your book, which I, I think is excellent, is that a lot of people argue today, um, as, as uh, young generations always do, assume that they have a new idea um, and that nobody has thought of it before. Uh, you said people argue, well, that was the past. People didn't understand back then. You make it very clear that, that there was plenty of arguments about how to deal with this, even among, you know, the, the uh, soldiers who were dealing with the situation. Um, and, 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 and there was a whole range of opinion. They might be all in favor of getting rid of the Indians, but not that way. Or, you know, not, we're not going to massacre them and so on and so forth. And so uh, it's, it's, a, it's very important, I think, to, to, to point that out, that it's not that people didn't have any awareness of this. They were being told by other people, you know, just like just like on the playgrounds uh, of, of our childhood. You know, people tell the bullies, you, you know, there's plenty of people telling bullies, don't be a bully. Uh, it doesn't stop the bullies if, if there's nothing else that isn't there to stop the bullies. So um, I think it's important that, that we don't just say, oh, that was the past because this is the present. There are people telling China, well, why don't you learn from what we did? Because this is a mess you're going to be dealing with for hundreds of years. Do you really want to do it this way? There, there are other ways even to accomplish the same thing that are less, uh, less devastating uh, to the population and also to your own population. But why, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, to go back to what you said at the beginning, um, historians call this, um, you know, the man of his times argument that's, Mm -hmm. you know, we shouldn't impose our so-called enlightened views Mm -hmm. uh, today on the past and on past actors. And so, you know, for me to be condemning actions that somebody took 100 years ago in their dealings with American Indians, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, you you know, you shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. But my point is that there were people at the time in the 19th century who were very aware that these uh, were damaging policies and practices and were speaking out against them and trying to change government policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, So one of the stories I tell in the book, um, uh, I I write about the places I've lived the longest. And one of the places I lived the longest was Colorado. I grew up in Colorado. And um, growing up as a child, I never learned of one of the most horrific massacres that occurred in Colorado called the Sand Creek Massacre of Northern Cheyenne and Southern Cheyenne, Northern and Southern Arapaho people. Uh, in southeastern Colorado. And, um, you know, I could go into a long story about that. But what I wanted to mention was that there were two soldiers who participated in that, who were ordered to go into the field and massacre uh, Indian people. And they refused. Mm -hmm. And they they refused to let their small group of men fire on uh, the Indian people there as well. And uh, their names were Silas Sewell and Joseph Kramer. Um, So, and then I talk about other people, somebody like Helen Hunt Jackson of the 19th Mm -hmm. century Mm -hmm. spoke out really forcefully against the land dispossession that was happening to American Indians in the 19th century and all sorts of other genocidal violence that was occurring. Mm -hmm. So I think it's incorrect to say that, Oh, people back then thought this was okay. Mm -hmm. No, they Mm -hmm. didn't. There was controversy about it. Um, And there was a big push to stop some of this behavior. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that the, what people call themselves, these uh, white settlers call themselves friends of the Indian. It Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they had uh, the best solutions or alternatives to this kind of violence. They, they ended up promoting, policies that were equally or were very damaging as well. Yeah. Um, let's go into some more of those details because it's very interesting, especially to people today who say uh, this person has contributed this positive thing, but they, they have some negative things too. And therefore we should eliminate everything that they've contributed um, to, to civilization. Um, that approach to things, because each of these people that tried to stop it, as you said, 
had difficulties. In, in, I mean, their, their opinion was not the one that we would agree with today. Um, and it's kind of hard to see, I think, if you're going to back to the past. If someone is moving from this position to this position, they don't usually get to the position that we are today if, if it keeps moving. One would hope that we would keep moving, right, and, and not stop anywhere. And so when we look back, of course, they can be some other place than we are. Um, and it's ironic, of course, because we're always talking about not imposing at this point, we're not imposing our beliefs on other people, but we are doing it by doing just what we're, what we're doing. We are imposing our beliefs on, on those other people um, by saying, you didn't do this the correct way. You did this in a half good way, but not a completely good way. The other thing that's interesting about the details that I, I want you to go into is the fact that it didn't really work out for them, uh, you know, positively to oppose this. This was, not, this was not a career enhancer for anybody who right. did it. So why don't you tell the story of, of Cranmer and so on, and how the Indians treat them and how, you know, because it's, it's, it's a nicely nuanced story. So I, I like it a lot. Yeah. So, um, you know, right after the Sand Creek Massacre occurred, um, which was in 1864, and, um, you know, the, there's not agreement on how many uh, Indian people were killed in this, but... Uh, upwards of 300 uh, around that amount. And um, the, the attack was led by a man named Colonel John Chippington, and it was partially ordered by the governor of Colorado at the time, the territory of Colorado, uh, Governor Evans. And um, so, and after this massacre occurred, there was like a concerted effort on the part of the governor, um, and uh, William Byers, who was the head of the Rocky Mountain News, editor of the Rocky Mountain News, to kind of uh, characterize this as a battle, not a massacre, and to turn it around that uh, Indian people were the aggressors rather than Chivington and the U.S., uh, uh, the forces that he um, commanded. Um, and there were four investigations, government investigations of Chivington, and they all determined that he'd uh, basically in our day, times, uh, the terms we would use today, he committed war crimes mm -hmm. and they all condemned him. Mm -hmm. But he got off scot-free because he quit the army before he could be court-martialed and he was never tried in a court of law, a civilian court of law. Mm -hmm. um, and he went on to have a long life. I mean, he had a very checkered life after that. But <laughs> Silas Sewell, uh, he uh, testified in the first investigation of uh, Colonel Chivington. And um, he was assassinated shortly after that testimony. Mm -hmm. uh, he was had just gotten married. He was out with his uh, new wife in the, on the streets of Denver mm -hmm. in uh, the, I believe, sometime in 1865. And he was shot down. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Kramer, uh, he, you know, he couldn't he was also seen as a kind of traitor mm -hmm. to his race. And he uh, had to move. Uh, he moved to Kansas and uh, he he shortly after died uh, as well. He wasn't assassinated, but he died. So uh, and now, you know, it, when you go to Colorado, there's Mount Evans. Mm, right. <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, there's a little town of Chivington. Granted, it's kind of the dilapidated, dilapidated little town. But <laughs> I just think it's really interesting that there's no like mountain named for Silas Sewell or mm -hmm. mountain named for Joseph Kramer. However, um, every year, the Northern and Southern Arapaho and Cheyenne people, they um, hold a spirit run from Sand Creek to Denver. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, they, they do this. And when they arrive in Denver, they go uh, to the street corner where Silas Sewell was shot. Mm -hmm. And they hold a little ceremony in his honor. Mm -hmm. um, they remember him and they they celebrate his life. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, several years ago in 2014, uh, the uh, governor of, at the time, uh, Hickenlooper, actually apologized for the Sand Creek Massacre mm -hmm. at this at this uh, site where mm -hmm. Sewell had been uh, killed. Mm -hmm. So. 
It is interesting. I mean, one of the things I like to think about in the book is that some horrific abuses happen and then there's a cover up of these abuses mm-hmm. uh, or there's an attempted cover up. What what you might call the big lie of the 19th century around Sand Creek or something. Um, and it it takes an inordinate amount of time to uh, challenge that lie and um bring out the truth. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first part of my book is really about confronting the truth about Mm -hmm. uh, the ways in which American Indians have been violently dispossessed of their lands. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, that's a little bit of the story. One of, one of the stories I I follow in the book. Yeah. I think it's uh, important for everybody who, who doesn't get the chance to read the book uh, to understand how, straightforward a massacre this was. This wasn't really up in the air. Um, there were 300 people or somewhere in that range killed. And almost every single one of them was either elderly, a woman or a child that the other people were gone. And not only that, but this was not a tribe that had been causing trouble. This is a very peaceable group of Indians um, that hadn't done, that they'd been working with them trying to, trying, trying to get along. Um, because they knew they knew that they were stuck between the white people and the Lakota tribe, right, or something like that. Um, I thought it was a great quote um, that you had about the Hungate uh, murder, that, that family murder that happened prior to the, the Sand Creek Massacre, I think, where you said uh, anyone who's responsible or anyone who's capable of such brutal butchery should be um, burned alive at the stake. That was what the, the, the essay called for. And I thought it said without any irony whatsoever uh, or, or self-knowledge that burning someone alive at the stake was probably a greater butchery uh, or brutality than whatever happened to the, to the family. Uh, there's not too many things worse than being burned alive at the stake. Um, and uh, I just found that a, a, a very telling detail. Um, you have a lot of them in the, in the book. A very telling detail mm-hmm. about how blind uh, people were to their own mm-hmm. situation. So, yes. Yeah. So uh, well, let's talk about about the, the what happened. Well, let's g- back up just a little bit. You, you said in 1840, before before Colorado became a center for the, uh, the uh, immigration in 1840, all the tribes had a great peace. They, 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 they were they had been warring with each other for a long time over different things. But they they before the uh, Europeans came. They created a peaceful treat, a peace treaty or something in order to share the lands. Right. Um, and had that had that worked uh, or at least fairly well worked for the 15 years before the next uh, problem started? <laughs> yes, it, it seems to have. And um, one of the points I make, too, is that one of the first people, uh, settlers, white settlers to move to Colorado was a man named William Bent and mm-hmm. his brother um, and. Uh, they set up a trading post in southeastern uh, Colorado, not far from the Sand Creek Massacre site. Mm-hmm. And um, they, you know, had really good trade relations with all the various native groups moving uh, through the area. Um, so, yes, it did seem that sort of front range of Colorado, mm-hmm. eastern Colorado from the mountains downward. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a, a place of enormous amounts of game, uh, bison, and um, it was a, a very, you know, it was a place a lot of people wanted to, um, if not occupy, uh, they wanted to at least hunt there and mm-hmm. um, move through that territory and trade in that territory. So it did seem that that little 15 year period was a pretty, pretty peaceable period. And then 1858 rolled around and and Colorado had its own gold rush. Um, Yes. And that was the end of that. (laughs) Yes. uh, The gold rush. uh, In fact, William Bent uh, was uh, a kind of representative, an an agent of the U S government when the gold rush started. And he wrote to the, his uh, superior in the government and said, wow, this is a bad situation. Mm -hmm. You have all these white settlers and other settlers streaming into Colorado. They're taking over the land that Indian people had once occupied. They're hunting all the game. They're destroying the habitat. Mm -hmm. They're starving. And you better, this is, this is an untenable situation. And 
they have, they're going to be in a horrible situation where they either have to be completely demoralized by this, or they're going to be violent. Um, Mm. and, um, in fact, some Cheyenne and Arapaho people did want to fight back to defend their lands and their mm-hmm. territories. Others, like uh, the chief Black Kettle, a Cheyenne, uh, Southern Cheyenne chief, really worried that if they engaged in any kind of violence, they would be uh, met with horrific violence of their own. And he was very prescient. That's actually mm-hmm. what happened. Mm-hmm. But the irony is it was his group and some of the uh, Southern Arapaho and, and other uh, groups who decided they wanted to pursue peace, they were the ones who were massacred at Sand Creek. So, right. um, just horrific, uh, tales. Yeah. Um, so we, we, he, he then did a tour maybe, maybe 10, 20 years later or something like that to try to raise awareness. The chief did, um, who, who survived the massacre because he wasn't there. He was gone with the men on, on, a, on a different mission, right? Something like that. So anyway, you, you have a couple of people go to the East Coast, um, raise social awareness uh, about the issue, um, and some people get excited about it. Um, and the end result is more problems. Uh, so why don't you tell, tell that tale? Because this is not just good intentions solve problems good intentions also pave the road to hell as well so um, <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you explain that a little in this case yeah so the other part of part one uh mm-hmm. the, tr- the the truth um is that i look at um where i am now in nebraska and i i uh, spend a lot of time talking about what happened with the ponca people here in nebraska uh who were who had you know were also uh, a tribe that was at peace with the US government and they were only 700 people Mm -hmm. and they lived in kind of North central Nebraska where the Missouri and the Niobrara rivers meet. And they were forcibly removed in, you know, also horrific circumstances uh, in the 1870s and they were uh, marched uh, over 500 miles down to Indian territory, which is now Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And when they got there, the government hadn't made any provisions for them. They arrived too late to plant their crops and uh, they, f- they faced massive starvation um, and a quarter of their tribe died. Mm-hmm. And, um, but uh, one of the leaders of the Ponca, his name was standing Bear. He uh, decided after his son died and his son had begged him on his deathbed to be buried back in his homelands near the Niobrara. Uh, Standing Bear decided, I'm going to bring as many people as I can back to our homelands with me. Mm -hmm. And that's a long tale. Uh, Mm -hmm. I could go into more, but the upshot of it is that Standing Bear ended up going on a tour to the East Coast with uh, a young Omaha woman named uh, Suzette LaFleche. And uh, Suzette could speak Ponca and Omaha and English. Mm -hmm. And so she was the interpreter, but she also became a speaker in her own right. And her brother, Frank LaFleche, went along. And a journalist named Thomas Tibbles, a settler journalist named Thomas Tibbles, went too. And they went to the East Coast in 1879. And they were like the cause celeb of the time. And uh, they met with all sorts of literary luminaries and uh, people who had been ardent abolitionists like Wendell Phillips. Um, and they, they gave so many lectures in Boston, Philadelphia, New York City, Washington, D.C. Um, and they like they really generated a huge amount of interest in what they uh, had experienced and people. Um, these are kind of like wealthy or very upper middle class, uh, white, uh, urbanites on the East coast, many of whom had been ardent abolitionists. And now they, uh, found this new cause uh, to get behind. And at first, um, they were incensed by what had happened to the Ponca, how they'd been removed without their consent, um, and had lost their lands um, and how they they became incensed and wanted to find a way uh, to make what we would call restitution, Mm -hmm. meaning 
let's return the land to the Pancas. Let's return the Pancas to their land. Mm -hmm. But you know, that, that, um, that's exactly what the Pancas wanted. They wanted their Mm -hmm. land back. Mm -hmm. Um, that's what restitution is. Um, that was the, the fundamental crime against them was the loss of their land Mm -hmm. and the violent removal from it. So restitution meant restoring them to their land. But very soon, this group of people who now started to call themselves friends of the Indian, and that's kind of funny because it's not friends of the Indians, it's Mm -hmm. friends of the Indian. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. They quickly started moving away from restitution to um, what they thought would work better. And they, they started to become very concerned that American Indians should assimilate into American society. And um, they proposed two ways for this to happen. One was allotment of Indian land. Mm -hmm. So that means taking all the communally held land by a particular tribal nation and allotting it to individuals in little 160 acre plots. Mm -hmm. And um, then, well, what happens when there is, is there any land left over? Indeed, there was mm-hmm. 90 million acres mm-hmm. when you uh, totaled it all up over all these Indian nations. So allotment became just another means of stealing land. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these friends of the Indian thought this was great because it was going to promote a kind of capitalist entrepreneurial spirit uh, in American Indian people. And But it was a disaster because mm-hmm. they lost more land. And they even lost some of their allotted land. Um, The other uh, thing they proposed were Indian boarding schools. And um, the idea was to take Indian children away from their families for a good part of their childhood Mm -hmm. and raise them in these schools where they would supposedly learn English and convert to Christianity um, and learn skills. Um, but those Indian boarding schools turned out to be extremely abusive Mm -hmm. and punitive institutions that really caused a huge amount of uh, problems, uh, within American Indian communities. And also they involved forcibly removing children from their families, Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, especially when they first began. And so, Um, I see this as a really egregious human rights abuse to uh, separate children from their families forcibly in this way Mm -hmm. and then to subject them to this extremely harsh institutional upbringing. Mm -hmm. And ironically, now, you know, over 100 years later, uh, the governments of Canada and Australia have had uh, huge national truth and reconciliation processes to address the same uh, policy and practices that happened in their own countries around removing children and putting them in institutions. Mm-hmm. They call this the Stolen Generations of Australia. Mm-hmm. And uh, Canada had a six year uh, truth and reconciliation commission um, to deal with its what, what they called Indian residential schools. But Canada got its idea for the Indian residential schools from the United States. Mm -hmm. They even sent an emissary down here in 1879 to learn about our Indian boarding schools. Yeah, it's it's a one one small detail from what you said when they did the tour. Um, uh, Longfellow was one of the uh, literary uh, luminaries that that, uh, got to meet them. And he sounds just like Donald Trump. You know, he called her Pocahontas. I mean, it was his creation, Pocahontas. And um, it was like uh, nobody could think of something besides this literary image to put on every Indian woman. Um, So uh, you may be the first person ever to compare Longfellow to Donald Trump. (laughs) Probably the last um, one. (laughs) He actually wrote he wrote that uh, epic poem called Hiawatha. And that's what he called her. He called her. You're my Hiawatha to Suzette LaFleche. And, you know, she really hated that. She really yeah. hated being characterized as like the Indian princess, you right, know? Right, right. Um, so that was, that's a point I make as well is that it's really been hard for American Indian people to control the narrative about themselves. Mm-hmm. You know, even when they get a chance to speak like Suzette and Standing Bear did, um, 
settlers always bring a kind of set of assumptions about them and mm-hmm. presumptions and projections. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these may be like, oh, they're they're savage or they may be like Longfellow's idea that they're very romantic. Right. Uh, but they're frustrating. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's a, a big movement among American Indian people now to control their own narratives mm-hmm. and to have kind of this what, what you might call narrative sovereignty, you know, like that yeah. we're just so sick of being characterized in these stereotypical ways by uh, white settlers. Yeah, you mentioned that about how, you know, the, the uh, Indians uh, should have their own voice. Uh, I think one of the important things is, is that uh, in anything like this is for people not to think that there's one voice. There exactly. Is, there is not one voice. There's just as much variety as to... Uh, Almost everybody can see what the problem is uh, when you look at the history and, and why it's caused by that. But everybody's solution to, to problems varies based upon what they experience and what they think works and so on and so forth. So, you know, it, it could be somebody's well-intentioned thinking, oh, a boarding school would be a great idea for the children in order to be able to help them assimilate. It, it would be interesting to find out whether there were actually any government agents that joined those Friends of Indian uh, organizations and pushed the ideas that they wanted, um, you know, because the mm. government has done that many times uh, during the 60s. Uh, when, when we were young, they, they certainly got into all those organizations and pushed for narratives that would ruin the organization. Uh, so mm. um, it's, it's not a new strategy. <laughs> so I don't know whether there's yes. any history like that uh, available to know where some of those, uh, how, how you take an organization and, and, and get enthusiastic and enjoy, I mean, I mean just cooperate with the enthusiasm and then twirl it over in a different direction um, ha- happens all the time. That's a good good point. Uh, in this case, it wasn't some sort of government surveillance or sabotage. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really very close connections between government officials and the friends of the Indian. For example, Henry Dawes, mm-hmm. he started out, you know, just totally incensed by what the Ponca had experienced. And he wrote, helped to write this 500 page report uh, to, to bring restitution to the Poncas. But then he ended up being the primary architect of allotment. Mm -hmm. He was a Senator in Massachusetts and he was, uh, you know, very much involved in the uh, friends of the Indian uh, as was the founder of the very first Indian federal Indian boarding school, Carlisle Mm -hmm. in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Richard Henry Pratt. He was a darling of Mm -hmm. the friends of the Indian movement. So there was a lot of, um, back and forth between government and the friends of the Indian group. And so it wasn't like there was somebody trying to undermine them and pervert them. It was, I think something, uh, I think a lot of dynamics were going on. One was, I think that there is a tendency among settlers then and and sometimes now too, mm-hmm. of thinking, oh, we settlers know what's best for Indian people. Mm-hmm. And even though Suzette LaFleche and Standing Bear were telling them what we want is our land back, mm-hmm. I think at some point they just started not listening to that. Mm-hmm. But also, I think that it was and remains hard for a lot of settlers to think that, you know, the... The founding crime against Native Americans is stealing land mm-hmm. and the and therefore the me, the most meaningful possible reparation is the return of land mm-hmm. or what, you know, there's a very strong Indian led movement now called land back. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think a lot of settlers are deeply uncomfortable with that. Um, and one of my points in the book is that we need to get over that. Mm-hmm. So. Um, a lot of Native Americans are trying everything possible to get more of their homelands back. Mm-hmm. So they might be buying it. Mm-hmm. Um, they they might be using various uh, programs through the government to do this. Um, but one of the things I uh, talk a lot about in the book are these kind of grassroots reconciliation efforts where individual white settlers or municipalities or environmental organizations or churches are actually giving small pieces of property back to native people. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, one of the things I found, of course, I'm, I'm sure there's people out there who are like, we want all the land back, Mm -hmm. but most native tribes are more like, 
we just want some of our land back. We right. want to have a place to perform our ceremonies. Or in the case of the Pawnees, we want to have a place to rebury our ancestors that we finally got repatriated to us. Mm-hmm. Or we want, uh, I just met a a really incredible gentleman recently in Colorado who's trying to establish uh, a 200,000 acre bison reserve in out in the national grasslands. This is public land. It's Mm -hmm. not anybody's private property. Mm -hmm. He wants to do that as partly an economic venture, but also uh, a spiritual um, reconnection for his people, uh, he's Cheyenne and Lakota, mm-hmm. um, and for children to come there, for mm-hmm. Native children to come and learn uh, about their traditions. So um, I don't think we settlers should be afraid of uh, returning land, uh, mm-hmm. but I think that's ultimately what undid the movement in the 19th century, is mm-hmm. that this is a time when people are taking up homesteading and um for them to really say, Hey, we, we've got to put the brakes on this and we've got to return land. Uh, it was a a kind of bridge too far for a lot of those uh, settler reformers of the 19th century. Yeah. As you mentioned in your book too, I mean, the government just looked at the Indians as nomads and and we we really can't have settlements with nomads running around from one place to the other, you know, living off the land and living off of us or whatever. Um, in the process. It's, it's, a, it's a hard mix. It's been a hard mix for thousands of years, uh, humanity, as it expands with population and everything. Though nomadic tribes get pushed to the side as the land gets used by many, many more people. Um, and maybe that's part of it. But it, I, I think a, a, a big issue for the future, as you said, is mm-hmm. how are we going to deal with the, the past depredations? And you can't just hand America back, uh, you know, to, to all the Indian tribes. Um, that that wouldn't work very well for them either, I'm sure. Um, but I think it's very simple just to say, look, if we look at our history for the last, say, 10,000 years or so, uh, every piece of land has most likely been stolen uh, dozens, if not hundreds of times by one group or another. Now, what are we going to do about that? Because I think part of it is the guilt. Part of it is feeling we, the settlers, did something or at least our, our, our grandparents or our great-grandparents or whatever did something that was reprehensible. And how long are we going to feel guilty about that? Because we didn't do that, right? Um, and, and if you just say everybody's great-great-grandparents or great-great-great-grand has, has done something like that at some time, now what are we going to do about it for each group? And, and as you said, if it's, if it's pretty simple if you just say, what's the most important part? You know, it's like, like doing any kind of negotiation. What's the most important thing that you want? This piece of land is probably much more important to you than it is to other people. Well, we can make that part of the deal and so on and so forth. I, I think it's not a matter of, of you know, you, you say truth and reconciliation. It seems more a matter of how wise are we going to be so that everybody in a democracy can live together with their own culture to the extent that they want it. And it doesn't, you know, it's not like uh, a depredating uh, culture. It's not like they're, they want to attack the next town all the time uh, anymore. So... And, and part of that history that you talked about was uh, that the brutality of, of the butchery between the two groups of people. Uh, it went both ways. I think that's a really good, important point to make, that the brutality was, was both ways. And it, it wasn't. And, and we know that the American Indian tribes fought brutally with each other as well. So if we just all accept that was a part of the past, that we don't want to be a part of the future, I think it's easier to come to conclusion about how we should move forward rather than argue about the past as much. So uh, your, the second part of your book is all about these truth and reconciliation ideas. Um, what I, I, I know what the settlers uh, want. What are the most popular forms of this for the American Indian tribes? You, you've mentioned that they would like some of their land back. What else would they like? One, one of the quotes I thought you really was a wonderful one was when you had one of the Indians say, um, we don't force our, why are you forcing your values on us? We don't force our values on you. You know, like, mm. let, let us have our, our space a little bit. And before I go any further, I wanted you to talk a little bit about the use of terms here. As, uh, I just said Indians. You use the word Indians, but you use indigenous as well, and you use Native Americans, and you use Alaska Natives. So why don't you say a little bit about at least the current way of talking about the issue and, 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 and what's appreciated or not appreciated. I'm sure that there's a wide range of opinion across the board. So why, why don't you, some of that complexity, I think, is useful. Why don't you let everybody know what, what's the current thing? 
Well, um, I probably can't. I probably don't know the current thing, <laughs> but um, well, you're a historian. But as you said, I mean, there's just a lot of um, varying views about what terms people prefer. Mm -hmm. In general, I think people prefer to use uh, the term for their own tribal nation, mm -hmm. um, but they often prefer to use the that term in their own language. So, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Here in Nebraska, we have the Winnebago tribe. That's that's not the term they use for themselves. They use the term Ho Chunk. Mm -hmm. So um, I think when you can be that specific, that's the best thing possible is mm -hmm. to use the term in one's own indigenous language. Um, I use the term indigenous when I'm talking about uh, people all over the world, uh, mm -hmm. not just in the United States. Um, I use the terms American Indian native american and native interchangeably pretty much in the united states but you know you'll run into people who dislike one of those terms or the other mm -hmm. just recently you know i um a friend of mine said to me oh i don't really like native american because we're native but we're not american we were not american right so he he prefers just to be called native mm -hmm. but you know then when you go to canada my canadian indigenous friends are like we would never call ourselves native. That sounds like savage or primitive or something. So, um, and then in Australia, uh, sometimes they use the word Aboriginal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they use that term in Canada as well. Um, so, you know, I, I want to encourage people not to get too hung up on the terms because mm -hmm. that can be paralyzing, you know, as a settler, you can think, Oh, I'm going to offend somebody if I say this or that. And, and you probably will offend somebody, but mm -hmm. you know, it's okay. The, the issue is more uh, let's talk about something deeper than that. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's, I mean, let's learn too, you know, let's learn from indigenous people about what they prefer to be called. Um, uh, and that may change over time, mm -hmm. you know, um, just as we, we change terms constantly. I remember when, you know, decades ago we were talking about global warming and now we talk about climate change and mm -hmm. now we talk about climate resilience. So mm -hmm. we're changing terms all the time, uh, as we grow and change. Mm -hmm. Great. So now the truth and reconciliation approach, why don't you tell a little bit about what's going on? You had some great stories, uh, about, um, so a settler family, giving away some of their land and so on and so forth. That was important land to, to uh, a group of people. So mm -hmm. why don't you talk about that? Because it's, it's interesting what's going on. Yeah. So uh, to back up a little bit, um, one of the things I do in the book is I look at these big, huge national truth and reconciliation uh, efforts that went on in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I'm sorry, Australia and Canada, although I do do a little on New Zealand as well. Yeah. Um, but... And at first, when I started this book, I was really envious of those nations. I was like, gosh, I just wish our nation could do something like that. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, I still do. And I, I think we need it. And there was just a, a bill introduced by Senator Warren and Sharice Staben and Tom Cole uh, to have a Truth and Reconciliation Commission around our Indian boarding schools. So I, I believe we still need that. Uh, but... But the more I got into it, the more I learned that some of those truth and reconciliation processes have been really unsatisfying to indigenous people in Canada and Australia. They haven't, they haven't brought the healing and the decolonization that indigenous people really want. So, and I think one of the reasons for that is that they haven't dealt with the foundational crime of land mm -hmm. dispossession and land stealing. Uh, and they're also, um, they are still carrying out some of the policies and practices. For example, indigenous children are uh, very much overrepresented, overrepresented in the foster care system in Australia and mm -hmm. Canada. They're still being removed from their families and put into foster care and up for adoption. So uh, that's that that stings. It's a great deal. very badly. And uh, to, to interrupt you, I want to talk about that topic for, for, for just a second. Mm -hmm. So what do the indigenous people in different countries think about that? Because they're being children are being removed. Uh, one would think based upon certain objective standards about about um, 
alcohol abuse or drug abuse by the parents or, or uh, inattentiveness or whatever. But what do the, I mean, nobody wants their children taken or not nobody. There are, there are some people who want their children taken away from them and we should. But, but there's such a small amount and we do that all the time in lots of cultures thinking we're going to make it better. Um, it reminds me when we go into Iraq and say, you know, Saddam Hussein was so bad to the people, he killed 30,000 people. We're going to make it better by having a war. And how many people did we kill in the war? You know, a lot more than 30,000 people. Uh, you know, if people would just pay attention to, to, to what they can accomplish uh, when they go in to try to uh, help a situation. There's lots of situations we'd love to make better. But if you go in and you make it worse, it, it doesn't help anybody. So this is really true about children everywhere. And, and when we yeah. finish talking about that, then I want to talk about the adoption issue, because that's another huge, huge issue uh, that's <laughs> universal across the whole across the whole world on this. So what do you think that the, uh, the indigenous people? I mean, obviously, there's so many different ones and so many different opinions. But why is this so uh, difficult when the numbers are so out of whack? I mean, it just makes them feel culturally. I mean, it's one way to make someone feel culturally inferior. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, it's an interesting issue because here in the United States, we actually have uh, greater protection uh, against these practices uh, by virtue of the Indian Child Welfare Act that was passed in 1978. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes it it gives tribes a lot more control and sovereignty over their own children. Um, and it puts a lot of safeguards in place to try to prevent this kind of wholesale removal of children. Because mm -hmm. in, the, you know, in 1970, about a third of all uh, uh, American Indian children were living apart from their families. Mm -hmm. Some in, were in foster care. Some were put up for adoption. Some were still in boarding schools. Mm -hmm. um, so the Indian Child Welfare Act uh, sought to deal with that. And Australia and Canada have sought to uh, indigenous activists there have tried to get something similar there. Um, in fact, I, uh, a previous book I wrote uh, is all about this issue. Mm -hmm. um, but in Canada, one of the things I think is most interesting is that uh, indigenous activists there led by an incredible person named Cindy Blackstock have shown that the government has uh, systematically underfunded uh, child, um, uh, Indian child welfare in, uh, on reserves in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, so that they have like increased the odds that children will grow up in impoverished families and, and increase the odds that those families will struggle and, um, increase the odds that the government will see fit to remove their children. Um, so, there's, you know, like a, a very big lawsuit going on in Canada around this issue right now. Um, so, yeah, it's um, it's extremely frustrating to indigenous people because it's a it's another uh, aspect of paternalism. It's mm -hmm. like we know best what's uh, what to do for your children. But indigenous communities have developed all sorts of programs. They don't deny that there's problems in their communities mm -hmm. and that they need to address those problems, but they want to be able to develop their own programs and get funding from the government mm -hmm. to be able to run those programs, just like a state does. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, it, yeah, it's a very important issue. Yeah. And, and a vicious cycle. Um, that is, in that in the more powerless the people are, the more poor and depressed they're going to be. I mean, it's one thing we should learn. It's very simple. It doesn't have anything to do with their race or their, their gender or, or, or anything like that. It has to do with having no power over your life or having so little power over your life that you can't control anything. And not, so, so why would you work hard for it? It's, it's been shown under communism. It's been shown under all kinds of situations that that uh, makes the productivity of people in terms of and their pleasure in, in trying to get something accomplished go way down. It's, it's not even so much the economic system. It's the powerlessness of it. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you had a communist system that wasn't didn't make the people powerless, it probably would work a lot better. So uh, as, as the Chinese have sort of demonstrated, you know, that they give out a certain amount of power, but not other power. And then it works better. So if we if, if we have situations where people are powerless and, and then you you go in and say, well, well, what kind of a culture do they have? Well, they had a different culture when they had power than they have when they're powerless. And that's always been true. And, and uh, so I'm glad to hear that there's some programs going on where they can take back some control and, and, and push it. But it seems like that's the easiest way for the government to deal with it as well, is to, is to 
put it back and they'll make decisions that don't work out, but so do we. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's all right. Everybody can, everybody can make their own mistakes. Like the argument against gay marriage years ago. Well, they, they might end up getting divorced. Well, yeah. <laughs> so 50% yeah. of, of the heterosexuals do too. That's not an argument against gay marriage. You know, those kind of arguments that people will, will not do things perfectly are, are, are mm -hmm. you know, straw men arguments. That's, that's for sure. Um, mm -hmm. So, Let's talk about adoption because that's an, an, another universal uh, issue that people, you know, are thinking about from a large number of point of view. Obviously, adoption of children that didn't have parents uh, has almost always been considered a great, great good in society. That people who couldn't have children or whatever the situation was or wanted to have more children would take care of children that otherwise were not being taken care of. So you didn't have orphans running around the street, which, you know, I've been in plenty of places where, you know, there's groups of children living on the streets um, in poorer countries uh, w without any adult supervision, it seems, just stealing their, their way to survive. And that's obviously not good either. But um, adoption has so many issues um, and taking someone from another culture and putting it in yours uh, is, is fraught. And how, how, how is that seen? That's uh, obviously an issue that's in your book that you raised. So I want you to talk about that a little mm -hmm. bit. Yeah. Um, so again, like the U.S. government had a, a a program called the Indian Adoption Project that they started in the 1950s, and so they moved away from institutionalizing children in boarding schools, indigenous children, to wanting to put them in uh, white families uh, for adoption, and you find these kind of horrifying quotes at least to me, horrifying, uh, that, um, you know, it, it didn't work uh, to assimilate Indian children through the boarding schools. What would work is to put them in white families where they won't have contact with um, any other Indian children. Hmm. They'll, they'll be very isolated and they'll lose total contact with their birth families, their birth communities. And this will truly solve the Indian problem. I mean, they said things like that in yeah. the fifties and sixties. And so there was a federal government program to promote Indian adoption. And then there was each state was also uh, engaged in this process of removing Indian children. And they often removed children without real cause. Um, mm. There was no evidence of neglect or abuse, but it, uh, they would often uh, remove children if they were, if they didn't have any indoor plumbing, mm. if they were sharing a bed with a brother or sister, uh, if um, they were being taken care of by grandparents. Mm -hmm. This is a really important issue because a lot of times social workers, settler social workers would come in and say, oh, we need to remove this child because the parents aren't around. They're just being taken care of by an auntie or a grandmother. Mm -hmm. um, but this was really common in indigenous cultures in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, mm -hmm. around the world. It was desirable for uh, children to be raised by their grandparents um, mm -hmm. or other relatives. Uh, in fact, in a lot of indigenous cultures, the kinship system is such that your mother's sister is also considered your mother. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there was just incredible misunderstanding of the way that uh, Native families uh, operated. And there was um, social workers often mischaracterized Indigenous families. You know, they mischaracterized poorness for negligence mm -hmm. or neglect. Um, so Adoption became a huge issue for Native uh, families in this country, also in Canada, Australia. And um, so this is one of the reasons the Indian Child Welfare Act uh, went into effect uh, after five years of testimony from Native people about what was going on, because they just felt like they were losing children from their communities mm -hmm. um, and that they were, be take, they were being taken without cause. It was just kind of a continuation of this policy from way back in the 19th century of removing children and separating families. Um, but, but in this case, it was even more uh, sinister because it was about permanently removing a child um, mm -hmm. from their family and community. Um, so yes, it's a, it's, it is a huge issue. And you may know that the Indian Child Welfare Act is under attack right now, mm -hmm. uh, that it's likely to end up in the Supreme Court. 
Um, so yeah, stay tuned <laughs> for that issue. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, again, a belief that uh, we can give you a better life because mm -hmm. it won't look like, you know, what we think you're living life. But uh, it's very hard to give someone a better life if their parents aren't there or if their mm -hmm. aunt isn't there or their grandparents. I mean, it's very, you know, it's, that has to be an awful, awful situation for you to do something better for that child than for them to be in that situation. Um, but it's applicable, you know, we've, we've done it for uh, adopting children from Asia and Africa and, and, and all over the world, uh, even uh, from Russia, so on and so forth. They, they can be uh, Caucasian children and brought into white families, but with a totally different uh, background culture, you still have issues. It's, it, it's, it's the taking it out of the person's family. Um, I just, uh, I, I have 11 brothers and sisters. And uh, there was a push. Somebody, some uh, senator in the early, uh, in the mid '60s, was saying, you know, we we should no one should have more than three or four children or something like that, and we should stop people from having any more than that. It was at that time when people were talking about that. Um, and so my father said, well, they're going to force me, you know, to to uh, you know get rid of eight of you. <laughs> he said, but don't worry. He said, I'll 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 just put you all you know, into, you know, the, the uh, orphanage and then I'll adopt you and the government will have to pay me for each of you to take care of you. <laughs> so he was planning ahead. Um, but these adoption issues are, are, are crucial. Uh, and and uh, in spite of the fact that someone can say, how can you raise that many kids? You know, you, almost every family figures out something, uh, mm -hmm. how to make it work. Um, so anyway, Great that you brought it up because I think that's a big issue way outside the American Indian uh, uh, issue and uh, certainly a crucial one for how a culture tries to eliminate another culture. And as you yes. said, you know, you, you can, that might not be the person who says, see, we'll, we'll give them a better life. We'll give them something, you know, different and better. They're not thinking I'm destroying that culture necessarily, but that's exactly what they want to do. You know, they, they, they're, they're saying they're going to try to destroy the culture of the child. Um, and I, it's a lot easier, you know, so to, to me, it's like we go around the world saying everybody should adopt our culture. We do this in our foreign policy and everything we do. Um, and you would think if you had a really good idea in your culture, other people are going to adopt it without you trying at all. They're just going to pick it up and mm -hmm. run with it. Right. Everybody, you know, whatever uses utensils or watches movies or uh, any, anything like that. We don't have to go around the world forcing anybody to watch movies. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so. Uh, talk a little bit about the truth and reconciliation, uh, you know, processes. We, we started off with that and we got it yeah. on attention. Yeah. But, but that's a, a big part of your book. And I, I think it's very important what, what they're doing because you're basing it on things that have been el done elsewhere and the difficulties and the advantages of that. I, I love it that you have a nuanced approach to it because there are always advantages and disadvantages to these things. It's mm -hmm. not, uh, not, not just all positive. So tell us a little bit more yeah. about that. Yeah, well, so originally I, I looked with envy about what was going on in Canada and Australia, but then uh, something happened where in 2018, um, I started working with a local uh, Lakota journalist here in Lincoln named Kevin Aberesk. And Kevin and I started doing interviews with uh, people who at the grassroots level were practicing some form of reconciliation. And our interviews have included both indigenous and non-indigenous people together. And it you know finally dawned on me that there's so much going on at this grassroots level and a lot of it is about land return so i open and close the book with a a ceremony at which uh two landowners in central nebraska art and helen tanderup uh they're white landowners mm -hmm. in their 60s are giving land back to the ponca people mm -hmm. um and then i have a large section in the book about the Pawnee people and how they've regained land in Nebraska through uh, private donations, uh, primarily by a man, a German American man named Roger Welsh. Um, so it really, when Kevin and I started to uncover hmm. uh, a lot of these kind of grassroots reconciliation, especially around land, land return and land restitution, it just struck me that that's so important, you know, because one of the weaknesses of the Canadian and Australian process was that if, if you're a settler, you could just check out, right? Mm -hmm. This is happening at, up here. You don't have to do anything in your own life. You don't have to get involved in any way. 
But when when something's happening in your own community or at a friend's farm down the road or, you know, at the, the tribe over there that, that lives nearby, um, there there's now opportunities for uh, us almost anywhere we live in the United States, those of us who are settlers, to get involved in these kinds of grassroots reconciliation efforts. For example, um, we just did some interviews and filming of the Pawnee people coming back to uh, harvest uh, corn mm-hmm. here in Nebraska that they're growing on. They have 20 farms that are owned by uh white settlers who are designating some of their land for the Pawnee to use to grow their 17 varieties of ancient sacred corn. Mm -hmm. Um, And so uh, we went and filmed this. It was like a joyous occasion, you Mm -hmm. know, like the, the white landowners, um, you know, joined us and, you know, joined the Pawnee people and harvesting the corn and then processing it. Um, And, and I, I think that, while the, that can't substitute for a kind of thoroughgoing national effort, it's a really important part of it. And one of the points of the book is that this grassroots reconciliation is going on. Um, and it's a crucial, critical part of any reckoning that we may do as a nation uh, with what happened to indigenous people and uh, the reparations or restitution that should be made or redress uh, that should be made to them for these passive uses. Yeah. And on a, on a, a very small scale, um, all kinds of people who feel that they don't belong or that they're, they're outcasts and so on and so forth this is true in all societies in different way. Um, most don't want you to fix their life, but they don't like just being ignored and overlooked as if they're not there or, and, and all you have to do is smile at, at, at people. It's harder under in the pandemic when we're all wearing masks, um, <laughs> but all you have to do is smile at people and you say, that's, you know, I don't hate you too. You know, I know that, that other people give you a hard time or whatever, but I don't also hate you. You're not hated by everybody. It's something everybody can do real easily. So we have a couple of questions that have come in um, that we'll, 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 we'll uh, try to get in before we bring this to an end. Um, um, from Susan Sullivan, building a relationship with the grandparents is excellent for young children. Normal aging can share their wisdom and teach the children. So that's, that's not really a question, but yes. I mean, we, it's, it's ironic that, that uh, our culture tells them you can't do it that way, or at least did in the 50s when, when now we, we often do the same thing. There's plenty of people who are working who, whose grandparents uh, you know, are, are watching the kids at least half mm-hmm. the time um, in order to make it a little easier. Um, here's one from Lily, um, evangel- evangelizing also erases people's culture. Can we help without converting people? You know, mm. that's, that's been brought up. I mean, you mentioned Twain and one of your other things, he brought that up, uh, you know, in, in, in our dealings with China, uh, he called it rice bowl Christians, you know, just mm. you hand out mm. rice and that's why they're Christian. Um, and, and obviously, uh, Lily, that's, you know, is there is there do you think that there's a hope that we can we can help each other uh, and help each other live their own cultures without actually telling people that they have to adopt some of ours? Yeah, well, it's a it's a really important observation from Lily because uh, churches, religious organizations have been really extremely involved in these uh, efforts, mm-hmm. uh, especially around boarding schools. Some churches ran their their own boarding schools um, and. Um, I think that, you know, I think today there's a lot of churches that are taking a really close look at themselves and their role in um, the past and toward indigenous peoples. I know like the Quakers are doing this. Um, There's a Lutheran church in Denver that transferred its property to the Four Winds Indian Council there. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a church on the Rosebud Lakota um, reservation that has gifted, I think, 300 acres uh, to the tribal nation. Um, so I think that, uh, I think churches today are doing some soul searching, so to speak, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, are thinking about their role in the past, uh, in, in, in their role in eradicating native cultures and then, uh, what they can do, uh, today to make up for that past and, uh, build better relationships, 
uh, with native communities. And, you know, when you hang out with native people, you know, that many of them are Christian, Mm. uh, many of them practice their own, uh, religions and, and Christianity seamlessly. Mm. Um, so when we were with the Pawnees, uh, they begin every, everything we do with a prayer, whether it's a meal or whether it's harvesting the corn. And sometimes somebody would give a prayer that's in the Pawnee language, Mm -hmm. um, and very much Pawnee religious oriented and other people would give a, a Christian prayer. So, um, so I think that, um, that's a really important issue is, is what role that religion and churches, um, can play in these kind of reconciliation efforts. And Lily has another comment, which is also threading the needle here, because uh, in a way for us to to move towards a human culture where every individual culture can still thrive when we realize they're not really threatening. You know, it's, we let the Amish live the way the Amish want to live. We let other groups mm-hmm. live the way they want to live. It's really not that threatening as long as they have the land and that's the way they want to do it. It's, you know, it, people don't need to be threatened by these things. Um, anyway, uh, Lily says, we can't feel guilty for ancestral mistakes, but we should not feel superior and must work on making it better for people that, you know, have, mm-hmm. have lost their thing. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, that, that's certainly true for the African-American enslavement in the United States as well. And it's ironic that the group who the, the, the soldiers who had just fought the Civil War then went out, you know, for, to, to, to free the African-Americans, then went out and, and uh, pretty much mm. destroyed the uh, Native Americans. Yeah. Well, I think that's an um, interesting point that um, I think, you know, when I bring up this issue that we settlers have a responsibility and we have accountability a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to feel guilt. You know, I, I'm not the one who did all these things. Um, you know, it's either my ancestors a long time ago did that, Mm. or it's, I just, my family arrived here in the 1950s. We didn't have anything to do with this. Why are you trying to make me feel guilty? Mm. It's not about that really. It's about being responsible. Mm. Um, and even if we had nothing to do with it, you know, personally, uh, the thing is if we're benefiting from it, you know, we have uh, benefited from the use of the land from which we dispossessed American Indian people. So there's this vast group of us, um, sorry, I'm getting a phone call here, (laughs) vast group of us uh, who have benefited from this. And I think we just need to own up to that, to realize that even if we didn't do it, we're still uh, living with um, the advantages that that conferred on us. And we do have a responsibility. We do have an accountability. And I feel like it's everybody we've interviewed, uh, every white settler who's engaged in this, they don't like say, oh gosh, I feel so guilty. I feel so Mm, bad. Uh, No, they're like, I'm having the time of my life. Mm. I have met so many great people. This has been why I was put on earth to, to make this return of land to the Pawnees or the Ponca people. Um, and these are deep affectionate relationships that have developed Mm -hmm. and they're really meaningful. So being responsible is not an occasion for guilt. It's an occasion for being a grown up and, Mm -hmm. and really realizing that we can thrive when we, take responsibility and reach out and make amends uh, that this isn't about cowering, you know, Mm. or, or, you know, being, you know, not being afraid to reach across these differences. Um, It's, it's truly remarkable to all the interviews we've done. This is a very empowering and enriching experience for people. And, Mm. and I don't mean that just for white settlers, we get that from the indigenous people who've been involved in these efforts as well, uh, mm-hmm. that they have developed really strong, meaningful relationships with uh, white settlers who are engaging in these practices. Yeah, I, I, it's a great point, uh, both Lily and, and that you made about it. Um, you said uh, we've all benefited from our use of their land. Right. And I think if we just stop and that's great that we just say now, let's all benefit from distributing power to everyone to live the way they want to, because we're going to be, everyone's going to be better off 
if we do that. We were gonna, we'd benefit from this much more than we benefited from the land that was stolen, um, in my opinion. It's the same thing like if, if you said you're, you're in the middle of the early 1900s and someone says, we should educate the women because if we educate the women, we'll have you know, twice as many people who can do things uh, economically valuable and, and twice as many good professors and all, all that kind of stuff. And the fact is, that's what's happened. You know, our, our society is much richer because so many more people are being productive in the ways that are a little bit closer. No one thinks that they're totally free to do what they want to, obviously, um, but a little bit closer to being able to do what you wanted to do with your life. And that will be true for every single group that we deal with. You know, if we make everybody give, distribute as much power to people as possible, that doesn't create chaos, obviously, but as much power as possible, uh, then we'll all benefit from that. And we can talk about how we benefited from stealing land and say, but we benefited much more from sharing uh, power with everybody. Um, and, mm. and that worked out much better. So let's stop stealing land. It's not, mm. it's not that productive. <laughs> and there's not much more land to steal anyway. Uh, you know, the last fight will be over Antarctica, and I don't think too many people are going to argue about that one. You, you mentioned in your book uh, that, that uh, the only people who haven't stolen land are, are Native Americans and, and uh, Alaska Natives. And I, I thought about it, and I thought, you know, probably the only place where land hasn't been stolen hundreds of times is Antarctica, because <laughs> <laughs> not too many people have tried to live there. But... Um, so that was a great discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Jacobs. We really appreciated it. Um, it was a great story about after it took 100 winters before they could come back to their land and plant the corn. That was, that's where the title comes from, from uh, Professor Jacobs' book. So thank you again very much. And so ends another event of the Commonwealth Club in its 119th year of enlightened discussion. Thank you. Thank you.